In this episode, computer science professor Dr. Jackie Rice examines the benefits and risks of artificial intelligence. Existing research demonstrates that men and women write and speak differently. But do men and women program differently? In this talk, Jackie will explore both the benefits of the amazing recent advances in artificial intelligence, as well as the risk that these present to society. Thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm, uh, I'm glad that Matt talked about community because in a sense this is a story about community and how my research has transitioned from the abstract to the practical, from computer chips to the impact of technology on people and communities. So when I started first here as a professor at the University of Lethbridge, my research focused on how to design computer chips better, how to make them smaller, more power efficient. I'm gonna step away from that mic. Um, a, few late, a few years later, I transitioned into an area called reversible logic, which is related to quantum computing, which you may have heard a little bit about here and there. But in the last eight years, I became more interested in an area of software engineering. I wanted to look, about, look at how people write programs, or we call it writing code. This was in part because of some work I did with a colleague in linguistics, so that's one of the beauties of the University of Lethbridge, this liberal education thing that encourages us to, encourages us to work with our colleagues in different areas. So I had intended some linguistics pr presentations and was fascinated to find out that in this area called sociolinguistics, there was a connection between who we are, that is our age, our experiences, where we grow up, our gender, and how we use language. My husband was also doing a PhD on an area focusing on gender, and so these thoughts were very much at the forefront of my mind. So in 2012, I was lucky enough to have a leave from my teaching and service duties and I spent that time in Lancaster, UK. I focused on these new questions that you see here and explored some of them with researchers in the School of Computing and Communications at Lancaster University. So these new questions were asking, do men and women code differently? Do people from different countries code differently? Do people with different experience levels write programs, that is code, differently? And are there quality implications? So why these questions? Well, I was curious, as many people at the university are. I just wanted to know. I wanted to answer the questions. But as well, there's a good reason behind it. Because software engineering and computer programs really are taking over the world. And 70%, optimistically, of a software project involves maintenance and evolution, which means reading programs and code other people have written. So I was thinking, code that is easier to read will help reduce the time required for this, at least in theory. And there are convincing arguments that code that is easier to read is less likely to contain bugs, which means less crashes on your iPhone and less of those annoying Microsoft error reports. Definitely a good thing. But what if these programs, the code that's out there, what if it's easier for some people to read but not everyone? So that brings me to the next questions. What can we do with this information? What does it tell us about diversity? Assuming, of course, that I can find a way to answer the questions in the first place. So these might seem like strange questions, but we know that there are huge divides in who goes into tech. Mostly we see far fewer women in this area. And we know that language can impact how we think and we also know that who we are impacts our use of language. Okay? So I wanted to build on that when I was answering some of these questions. We, we know these things because we see it in, in life, and of course people have done lots of work in this area. But the most obvious example is maybe how babies talk compared to how teenagers talk, and how adults talk. We, we know there's a lot of differences there. Having three children, I find it fascinating how difficult it sometimes is to communicate with my 16-year-old. But as well, where you grew up will impact your language use. And as an example, I confuse the word cupboards and closets all the time, as closet wasn't a term used in my British-rooted family. We only had cupboards. 
So from about the 1970s onwards, researchers had looked for ways to distinguish between groups when looking at people's writing, um, specifically between men and women's writing with varying answers. However, they were all analyzing their data by hand, reading books, reading newspapers, you know, using the human brain to do this analysis. And so usually in most of the studies, you're looking at most about 100 texts being analyzed. In the age of computers, where gigabytes of data are stored on devices the size of our hand, we have much more computing power available. So in the 2000s, researchers started using computers to do statistical analysis of the frequency of words. And they found that certainly there were differences in the way men use words and women use words. But it was still really time consuming work. So the next step was to broaden and automate the process and see what other differences could be identified. And several researchers in Illinois and Israel set out to do this using machine learning tools. Not only did they find, again, reliable differences in texts written by men versus texts written by women, they were also able to identify what those differences were. And this I find particularly interesting, those differences in the writing crossed languages between English and French, which were the two languages they were specifically looking at. So that brings me back to the questions I was asking. Would we see these kinds of differences between men's writing and women's writing in all types of writing, including writing code, that is, using programming languages. So my next step was to learn more about the tools that they had used and whether I might be able to use them in my work. And of course, as I learned more, I asked more questions. The tools used by those other researchers were based on artificial intelligence, or AI, a type of AI called machine learning. As I learned more about this, I began, began questioning a few things. AI is widely used, including choosing what you see next on your social media feed, making suggestions for online purchases based on other people's shopping habits, or possibly your own, or a combination teaching self-driving cars to navigate roads, loan decisions, recommender systems are used to advise the person sitting in front of you when you're asking about a mortgage or a car loan. It's not that person deciding what your rate, your interest rate will be. It's a system, a, a computerized system. Recommendations about granting parole. AI systems are used in the US to decide based on historical data if a prisoner is likely to reoffend. And there are applications in insurance, diagnostic medicine, and education. But why worry about this? It's going fine, isn't it? Well, we might worry because the models, or in other words, the mathematical predictors that drive these tools that we create tend to have our human biases built into them. What can that mean? Well, it means, for instance, that facial recognition software tends to be much better at recognizing white male faces. Eh, who cares about facial recognition? Well, most of us do. It's everywhere. Okay, it's in your phones. If you have the latest and greatest phone, it's using facial recognition to check that you are the person who's supposed to be using the phone. It's used at airports. And it's used for many other security-related purposes. So if you're a white guy, it's pretty accurate, better than 80%. But if you're a black woman, the accuracy declines significantly, which sucks if you happen to look like somebody who has committed a crime or is on a watch list. There's all sorts of interesting things about this, but what I find particularly fascinating is that this was reported in February 2018. Since then, IBM and Microsoft have vowed and acted to change their facial recognition systems, but Amazon, apparently a front runner in the field, was again in the news in January of 2019, so they gave them a year. And they were in the news for the poor performance of their facial recognition and facial anal analysis systems. If you want to go further down the rabbit hole, here's an interesting article that discusses these downfalls. But it also takes it a bit further and concludes with the possible pitfalls of racial recognition in general. 
I've also got another little clip on this slide um, talking about an AI system imitating humans, and that's in the chatbot created by Microsoft, which, according to the headlines, learned how to be a racist asshole in less than a day. <laughs> we'll talk more about that later. There are many, many more examples of how our unconscious biases are being built into AI tools. In an example that's close to my heart, one common recruitment technique in the US is to purchase large lists of names. And so some way of shrinking down those millions of names is required. But our history has not been kind to many groups, and so data based on historical success is going to reflect those historical biases. So students who have had the privilege of not having to work a part-time job, of going to a good high school, of having a parent or a relative who knows how to navigate the post-secondary system, and of having support enabling them to focus on their studies. These are the students who are targeted based on the AI tools that are used to shrink those lists down. But history also tells us that these disadvantaged students don't have the benefits that I just mentioned, so they are left out of those lists through no fault of their own. And even those who end up being chosen for attention are forced to contend with systems that allocate points for grades, extracurricular activities, and of course the SAT scores, because those same universities are also playing the numbers game to get students who will boost their metrics so that the universities can do better on national rankings and guess, thus get more money in the form of enrollment dollars, research dollars, and donations. So what we have is a nasty little cycle that's feeding back on itself. Here's another example. Back in the 1970s, a UK hospital wanted to automatically filter the job candidates it received. The number was far too high to be managed by humans. They wanted to get it down from the middle thousands of applicants to around 500, at which point humans would be able to take over. How to do that? How to automate that? Well, the system had to be trained to follow the same process as the humans had. One requirement was good command of the English language, as the patient base was in England and primarily English speaking. So resumes and applications with spelling errors and poor grammar were tossed. Makes sense. But this was in the 70s and early 80s. And at that point, we did not have computerized systems that could judge bad grammar. We do now, but not then. So how to do that? Well, the system had identified a trend. Many applications that were poorly written came from applicants from certain countries. So the system started filtering out any applications from those countries and from neighborhoods in the UK, which had high numbers of immigrants from those countries, countries in Africa, for instance. <laughs> Women were also rejected as the system had learned that its human trainers, or from its human trainers rather, that women were more likely to have their careers interrupted when raising children. The hospital was found guilty of racial and gender discrimination in 1988 because of this. If you Google high-tech hiring using AI, you get headlines like this. The next frontier in hiring is AI-driven. But there's also headlines like this one, which have dropped off our radar, and the first page of Google hits, Amazon scraps secret AI recruiting tool that shows bias against women. Notice the date, it's pretty small, but it's up there, 2018, 30 years later. So what have we learned? Well, the problem is that the data was at fault. So this system, used by Amazon, was trained on the last 10 years of hiring data. And at that point, there had been far more men hired into the company than women. What did it look for? It looked for activities and experiences that made the candidates successful as they stayed on with the company. These were activities and experiences that men were more likely to have participated in. That's what the system looked for. What do you do when your courts are busier than ever? And there's more and more pressure to make fast and accurate sentencing decisions. 
you might turn to automation there too. We haven't gone quite as far as having robots for guards, although we might wonder why not. But in 24 US states, they are turning to, again, these things called re recommender systems to help advise the people making decisions about whether an individual will commit a crime. If they decide there is high risk, that individual goes to jail. Otherwise, they may just get a fine or other types of less significant punishment. How are those systems trained? And how do we slot people into those systems? Well. The offenders are asked to fill in a questionnaire, and it asks about their family, their neighborhood, their friends, when they first interacted with police. They're not allowed to ask about race. That's illegal. But in essence, an individual from a poor neighborhood who may have had a family member in jail, who may have been stopped by police at a young age, those individuals are considered to have a higher chance of reoffending. And as we saw on the previous slide, these are more likely to be factors for minority groups, in part because of policing approaches that focus on known high crime areas. The problem is, and we're seeing this here in Lethbridge, if everybody knows there is more crime happening in a certain area, you tend to focus your policing efforts there. Okay, so what happens? More people are stopped, more people are questioned, more people get stressed by having to explain their actions to the police, and in the end, you have an increase in incidents. But that could happen anywhere. If I was stopped constantly by the police and asked to explain what I was doing, I'd probably end up being a little frustrated and eventually maybe lashing out, and the cycle begins. So this is an example of a learning system that is affecting its environment and then reinforcing its results through those effects. Okay. And these are what this particular woman defines as a weapon of math destruction. And these examples that I'm talking about are US examples. They're from this particular book. Um, but they're not just restricted to the US. Here in Alberta, we hear rumors of a new system for funding our schools based on performance rather than enrollment. And that's been done in the US as well. In Washington, they developed an evaluation system for their schools. And what it did is measure the progress of students at the start and the end of each year and attributed any progress or lack of to the teacher. And if the teacher was flagged as being bad, they were fired. So the problem with this is, what about a bad year? What about a year where there's a natural disaster or a school shooting? What about a situation where there are a few students with behavioral difficulties that take more than the usual amount of the teacher's time? And what about a classroom that's gone from 25 students to 40, possibly because of cutbacks? What about a teacher who tries something new and innovative that could be a huge benefit to students, but you know, there's some quirks that need to be worked out. This system didn't allow for that. It didn't care. And to be honest, I don't know how you could build a system that would account for those kinds of things. So I'm hopeful that we don't go down that pathway anytime soon. Let's talk a little bit about the technology. Take a step back from all that to see if we can understand why this might be happening. I'll use image recognition as an example, because I like to show you cat pictures. <laughs> Before 2010 or so, image recognition was so difficult that a man named Louis von Ahn created a game where two people would be paired up over the internet, so they didn't know each other. And what they had to do is choose words that, that described a particular picture, and they both, they both got to see that picture, same picture. Um, and if their words matched, they got points. And people loved playing this game. It was everywhere for a few years. And so what this did for, for Dr. Von Ahn was that it created a huge database of words attached to pictures so that we, you and me, could search the internet for cat pictures. <laughs> but in 2015, Dr. Fei-Fei Li, who's shown on this slide, gave a TED talk on how we're teaching computers to understand pictures. 
Prior to this, computer scientists had, had tried to teach computers how to identify, for example, cat pictures by describing what a cat is, what color the fur is, whiskers, ears, tail, size. Well, there's a lot of variation there, and this failed miserably. So Dr. Lee asked, how do humans learn to identify a cat? And she thought about it and did some research, of course, and realized that what we do is we show pictures and examples over and over to children. And we say, that's a cat. Nice kitty. Soft kitty. <laughs> and so on. So we reinforce over and over that a particular pattern of pixels, if you like, is a cat, forms a cat. Her approach was to do this with an algorithm that could learn and this approach pretty much single-handedly solved the problem of image recognition. So this is called supervised learning, which is one type of machine learning technique which falls under the big umbrella of artificial intelligence. And the way it works is we tell the program what labels we're trying to apply. So are we looking for something that's a cat or not a cat? We define how we're storing the information and what features to look for, so that's what we call it, feature vectors. And then we give the program a bunch of pictures that are already labeled for us. These are cats, these are not cats. And as you can imagine, the internet has plenty of training data available. In fact, when I did this Google search, it came up with more than five billion. There's two more steps. Now we need an algorithm, generally based on probabilities, to identify which features most closely correlate with a particular label, and this creates what we call a model. In other words, what we're saying is, if we see these things, is that a good predictor of whether this is a cat or not? Okay. Then we test it out. We say, okay, here's a bunch of pictures. Are they cats or not? And hopefully, we get fairly good accuracy. We're looking for somewhere in the range of 80 to 90 percent, depending on the safety critical aspects of the system. Obviously, if it's a safety related system, we want pretty close to 100 percent accuracy for, for our model. So to tie this back to my research, this is what the researchers did to distinguish between male and female authors. They used something called the British National Corpus, a huge database of um, English writing. They use that to train their algorithm and create a model that correlated certain words or word groupings with the labels male and female, depending on the sex of the author. Then they tested their model on other pieces of literature where the sex of the author was known, and they came up with pretty good results. So they were able to identify the, the sex of the author with 80 to 85% accuracy. So they were pretty pleased with that. Okay, so now we have a system for, for teaching computers things. And we can build these models for predicting or for identifying things. It's based on math, but don't worry, we're not going to talk about the math tonight. In fact, that is one of the amazing and scary things about this tool and this suite of tools is that you don't have to know anything about how it works in order to use it. All you need to know is that you've got some data, you've figured out some things to measure in that data, and you've trained the algorithm using some pre-labeled data. How could this possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, let me tell you. One group of researchers set out to train a model to identify good photos using photos on uh, social media. So, I mean, when I take photos, half of them are blurry, I got my thumb over the lens, you know, they're terrible, right? So I don't wanna take time to go through and filter those out by myself, because I don't have time. Who has time for that? I want the computer to do that. Seems reasonable. So what they did is they took all these photos off social media, and they said, well, how are we going to decide which ones are good photos and which ones are bad? I know. We'll use the likes that they get on social media. <laughs> so what happened? Well, they found out that good photos correlate to photos of young white women because those ones get more likes than any other type of photo. So, I mean, it's a good idea, but their labels had not been chosen very well for what they were trying to train quality, right? And if we think about that hospital that was on the forefront of using AI to filter job applicants, their intent was really good. 
But the metrics they use to identify quality in their applicants, not so well chosen. Okay. What else impacts the model? Well, you saw the earlier clip about the Microsoft chatbot. Based on artificial intelligence, they put it out on social media so it could learn from humans about how to have conversations. And then they de deactivated it when they found it making racist and misogynistic statements. It took 24 hours for the bot to go from making statements like, I like puppies, to saying racist things about President Obama, then the President of the United States, and, and far worse. <laughs> this chat bot was basically an algorithm that learned from interacting with people on the internet. And really what this was was a lesson in how biased human beings really are. The algorithm was trained on data, reflecting all of those biases, tweets, social media posts, and arguably humanity at its worst. And so that's what it learned. And that's what it gave back to us. Garbage in, garbage out. So why should we care? If none of these examples impact you, why should you, everyone sitting there, care about this? Well, hopefully you already do. But if you don't, let me give you this other story. One Canadian insurance company is now only selling life insurance if you agree to provide data on your lifestyle via a smart device, so a Fitbit or one of those things that measures your heart rate and your movement during the day. The implication is that they'll raise your rates if you don't live a healthy lifestyle. Of course, what do they mean by healthy? Who gets to decide? If you don't get your steps in one week, do your rates go up? And what about people who can't or won't provide this data? Are their rates higher? I'm betting they are. And don't even get me started on the privacy aspects of gathering health data 24-7. So that, that's something to think about. And the last time I renewed my car insurance, they offered me a lower rate if I had a good credit rating. So they wanted to check my credit. And then they said, if it comes in under a certain score, we can give you a better rate. Like, OK. But well, what's the connection there? I don't know. But AI tools found it. And one thing insurance companies do really, really well is make money. So they must have found some way to make money with that. Right? Well, what's the problem with that? Well, it's good for me. But what about the person who has a lower credit rating because, say, they have a lot of student loans that they haven't been able to pay regularly? Or they got laid off from the oil patch those people will end up getting higher insurance rates, which means paying more to insure their car and less money for other things. Maybe snow tires, more likelihood of accidents, I don't know. Maybe they could use that money to pay down another debt. So what we're seeing here is, again, this nasty cycle, right? The people who aren't on the good end of the prediction are, are being forced to actually go down a worse path. And the tools are feeding that cycle, right? This is one of those characteristics of a weapon of math destruction that we saw as the title of that book. They create data that reinforces the biases inherent in the model. And if you want to read more about how um, the insurance company is kind of on the forefront of these things, you can look at the book. The author tells us all about how the trucking industry is turning to constant surveillance and logging to gather data. And hopefully that data will be used with AI tools to look for patterns that will make the trucking industry more efficient, safer, cheaper. We can hope. But whatever they do, it will be a preview of the next step for the auto insurance industry as a whole. So it's, it's coming. All right, it's not all bad. There are some amazing innovators using artificial intelligence for good. For instance, Hima Bindu Lakaraju, who designed an AI system that helps check for bias in decisions made by judges or doctors. She's also designed a system to help predict which students in elementary schools might be at risk for falling behind so that they can get extra mentoring or receive extra tutoring. 
And Rediet Abibi was educated at Harvard, but had her experiences as a child in Ethiopia driving her. She has been instrumental in developing models to analyze health data for the 54 African nations. And she's providing that information to the governmental agencies, as well as using that information to try and minimize health disparities in the United States. And Camille Francois, who is trying to use AI to detect the source of organized disinformation campaigns, and worse, harassment campaigns. They call these troll farms, but the trick is, how do we distinguish between, between these troll farms and genuine voices raising concerns that might not be popular? So those are three of the 35 listed at that particular website. There are many, many more people out there doing amazing things to try and make the world a better place. And AI is, is certainly a part of it. Um, even here at the university, there was a, an announcement today about some colleagues of mine in, uh, in, in uh, neuroscience, I believe, who are using AI to detry, try and detect um, uh, neural problems with the brain by looking at how people move. So this is cutting edge. I didn't put it in my script. So I'm, I apologize if I haven't described it very well. Companies themselves are trying to do better as well. They're trying to come up with more equitable hiring processes. They're, they're thinking about the concerns over the impacts of their tools. And there's a general recognition that this can be a problem. You'll notice the picture of the hands with this article headline. That's a reminder from 2016, when it was found that a Google search for the word hands came up almost exclusively with white hands. Try it for yourself. Once you're looking for it, it's, it's, it's quite eye-opening. And many research groups and policy-making groups are contributing to the discussion. A lot of this discussion focuses around the potential for purposely malicious uses, such as political disruption or weaponization. Some discussion is on accidents, for instance, if a self-driving car misunderstands its environment. But considering the accidental impact on individuals, like we've been talking about in, in, in this talk, it's not necessarily part of this discussion, and it really needs to be. We can't let that perspective get lost. So I've got this chart, it's pretty colors, I know you can't read any of it, um, from the, Bar the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society in Harvard. And what it's trying to illustrate is how artificial intelligence principles are being developed by companies, professional societies, governments, advocacy groups, and, and other people concerned about the development and application of AI tools. And it is worth a, a closer look. So I want to look at, um, for instance, let's look at Microsoft. Okay, so there's Microsoft. And each of those circles represents how, um, how much the principles that are published by those companies um, focus on a particular area. So the outermost circle there is human rights. So if there's a big diamond on that circle, that's a good thing. If there's a little teeny diamond, it means that particular company isn't really talking very much about human rights, okay? The next circle in is labeled promotion of human values. And again, if there's a big circle on that line next to the company, that's good. If there's no circle, not so good. Professional responsibility is next. Human control of technology, fairness and non-discrimination, transparency and explainability, safety and security, accountability and privacy, so on. And I'm actually most interested in that big empty spot next to where we see Microsoft's name. And that empty spot is all about, it's, it's all in those human values, promotion of human values, professional responsibility, responsibility, human control of technology. We're not talking a whole lot about those things, and yet, and yet, this is what Microsoft is telling us about how they're focusing on artificial intelligence. We're infusing artificial intelligence across everything we make in an effort to democratize AI and help solve society's greatest challenges. So shouldn't their principles talk about promotion of human values and human control of technology? A Little bit of a disconnect, maybe. And going back to our lovely chart, even government agencies, which are the ones in green I've kind of highlighted here, they're not all that strong on the outer circles, human rights, 
promotion of human values, professional control of technology, and so on, there's, again, this, this big gap next to a lot of those, co those country, um, those, those organizations representing the countries. Um, unfortunately, there's no group representing Canada here. There are groups from Europe, China, Japan, US, et cetera, but none for Canada. So we don't have a good sense of where Canada, Canada's government, that is, um, stands on, on these concerns. Okay. So back to my story. I want to make sure that what I'm doing with artificial intelligence and machine learning tools isn't going to basically do anything bad. So I, I want to really pay attention to these lessons that I've gathered as I've been doing this research. So I'm trying to gather data that will be broader, broadly representative of people writing computer programs. That's what I'm looking at. I want to get data from students, professionals, men, women, people from around the world. I need to think about what I'm measuring. I need to figure out what's useful to look at. I don't want to fall into that trap that other researchers have of using metrics that aren't measuring what I want. Right? I don't want pictures of young white women. <laughs> so what I can do is I can look at the style of the code people are written, how it's laid out. We can look at the words and symbols that make up the code and how they're grouped. And we can look at how people organize things in different ways. And let's say that I do find out, for instance, that men and women write code differently. Or the people from India write code differently from those in Russia. What should we do with that information? Well, what I want to propose to do is look at this as a communications problem. How can we improve communication between programmers who might have tendencies to write code one way and others who write their code in different ways? Can we create translation tools that alter the style so the code is more readable? Potentially. And so why is this research important? Well, I believe that this is important research because, in part, it tells us how people think and process information. How we solve complex problems is clearly laid out in the programs and code that we write. So this could give us an insight into how language reflects that. But as well, as I mentioned at the start, so much of our lives are managed by computers. And more and more code is finding its way into decisions about our lives. And I want that code to be something that everyone can understand. I don't want someone who is a different gender or educated in a different country to have difficulty understanding code because it's written in a different way. So I'm trying to use AI in a, in a way that I hope will cause as little harm as possible while offering several possible avenues for benefit. So what we've seen in this talk is tools like machine learning being used to find correlations and patterns in data, usually in data sets that are far too large for human analysis. Those correlations and patterns often connect behaviors and risk factors based on what's happened in the past. Is this going to continue to create and, and contribute to social divides? Probably. Does it have to be that way? No. If we're careful about our data and our metrics and how we use the results, AI does not have to be a bad thing. But to avoid creating bigger problems than the ones we're trying to solve, we need to understand how the tools work and what the pitfalls might be and continue to ask questions. And because I'm a professor and a teacher, if you wanted to do more homework, feel free to take a picture of the slide. There's a number of links that offer background on machine learning, um, information about how it's being used, um, and, and lots of interesting bits and pieces for your future reading. Thank you very much. <laughs>